So again, we're gonna talk all about pricing our work. And I know as freelancers, this can be tough. I think most freelancers or creatives struggle with the part of running their business. So we all have a skill that we spend a long time developing. We sometimes spend a lot of money developing those skills and we get really good at what we do and perhaps we even specialize in what we do. And that means that there's somebody out there who could really benefit from what we have to offer. So great, you've done that, you've got your work in a portfolio, but, um, and we talked last week about finding clients. So if you haven't watched that live stream, make sure you bookmark that and check that out later. But okay, so let's say you've, you found your clients or you're starting to get client inquiries, but how do you price your work and how do you know if you're charging enough? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So again, before we get into this, you gotta remember that you have something that somebody wants enough that they're asking you about your services. So that means they're already prepared to pay for what they need and they've also identified an opportunity or there's some sort of pain point in their business that they're coming to you to resolve. So it's your chance and your duty to help them get what they want. That should not ever come for free. You don't go to a dentist, you don't go to a lawyer, you don't go to a grocery store and just expect to haggle over prices, keep telling them that their prices are too high, asking for a discount or say, hey, fix this cavity for me here and if it's good, I'll come back and give you some more work in the future, right? You don't do that and nor would those professions deal with that type of a client. So I wanna make it clear that you need to think of yourself as a business and a service provider that is legitimately offering some valuable service. And with that, you can um, come into their business and, and, and help them with what they need. And you should and uh, need to get compensated for that as well, okay? So just gonna get that out of the way real quick. Again, I just thought of something. I hate to break it. Um, I'm gonna take a quick second. All right, guys, just a quick update. If you're on Instagram, I wanna mention live streams going. Um, I know I made it sound like there was issues. There were issues, but um, that got resolved fairly quickly and I didn't wanna make anyone here think that the live stream was not happening. We're going, we're good, we just started. So hop, uh, hop on over, again, links in the bio. All right, thank you guys for letting me do that real quick. Sorry for the interruption. I'm gonna pop into my notes and get into this. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is pricing models. So when it comes to pricing your work, you need to be able to identify a, a few things. What your, um, not what your time is worth, let's see. You need to be able to consider the different pricing models that you have available. So pricing models could include something like hourly, daily, a monthly retainer, or project-based pricing. So let's start with these. And again, this isn't comprehensive, but these are the ones that I think are the most popular and the most practical. So I think the first one, hourly pricing, is the first, um, it's the most logical, and it's probably the one freelancers or creatives are most tempted to do, especially in the beginning, because it seems easy. It seems easy to say, well, okay, I think this project will take 10 hours, and my time is worth $70 an hour, so I'll charge the client $700. But there's a lot wrong with this. While it makes it easy to give somebody a straight answer when somebody wants to um, find out how much a project will cost, uh, it, it ends up biting you in the end in many ways that we'll get into. Um, so let me say the first thing, when someone's reaching out to get in contact with you about doing some work, generally one of their first questions is gonna be, how much will it cost to do X? That tells you right away, if that's one of their earliest questions, is that they are shopping. They're doing price comparisons. They're trying to find out if you are more or less expensive than their other options. So the first thing to consider is when that's one of their first questions is that they are trying to find out if you are within their budget. While that sounds bad, it's actually good because clients who are willing to talk about money right up front um, are going to be able to save you time because if the conversation goes right to money, you can cut them out as a possible client if you find out they're unwilling to spend what your services are going to cost. So, well, again, so if somebody's coming to you asking how much something's going to cost, take it as an opportunity to put money uh, at the front of the conversation and make sure that 
uh, by asking the right questions, you can identify whether or not they're worth spending your time on. What you don't want to do is go making a bunch of proposals that take a lot of time, you know, one, two, three, four hours at a time, and then exchanging a bunch of emails and having some phone calls, all to find out that the client decides you're too expensive. Okay, so back to hourly discussions. The reason I don't want to suggest that you go with hourly is because if you work fast, if you are good at what you do, you are going to make less money. If you drag your feet and if you are slow, then you make more money. So you want to get um, rewarded for being good at what you do and quick at what you do. And because of that reason, you shouldn't charge hourly. The other issue with charging hourly is it undermines you as a professional. It actually makes you look like a commodity because they can just basically say, oh, we're just buying hours from somebody. And you don't really matter. You're not, um, you're not placing a premium on your experience, your intuition, the tools you have, the creative problem solving that you bring to the table. So those are all major issues with charging hourly. Okay, I don't want to hit this one to death, but um, I think I made my point. I'm not a big fan of hourly. So let's talk about daily rates. Now, daily rates, depending on the industry you're in, is pretty popular, especially with uh, VFX and within the entertainment industry. And the reason day rates exist is because oftentimes production companies and agencies who are working on, say, big ad campaigns or films and stuff, they need to quickly grow their team and then contract their team based on the jobs they have. What that means is they need to be able to put creative designers um, into, you know, behind computers for a certain period of time, and then they need to be able to clear that overhead so they can keep their doors open. So what that means is they need to know how much you cost per day so they can uh, price out their whole production and get an accurate idea of how much things will cost. So it's pretty common in the entertainment industry to start in the range of maybe a couple hundred bucks a day, but then as you become more and more specialized, you may get up over $1,000 a day. Somewhere in between is where most people work who have mid medium experience in that four to $500 range. And again, I take a similar issue to charging by the day as I do hourly because it commoditizes you and your work. Now, it's more appropriate in some situations when working on a big production within, say, an entertainment industry because, again, you are like part of a big machine and you are basically just, um, they have you there, yes, for your skills, but more or less to get the job done, less as a consultant, if that makes sense. But if you're working direct to client, then you should be focused on establishing yourself as a trusted creative consultant, okay? So there's there's hourly and there's daily. Um, and then the next thing on my list I had was monthly retainers. And monthly retainers are kind of interesting. If you're looking to have some steady repeat work that allows you to have predictable income month to month, then a monthly retainer is a pretty good option, especially if you're working with smaller clients who can't afford to keep a new hire busy around the clock, then you can come in and offer services on a monthly retainer. So if you say, hey, I'm going to charge you 300 bucks a month, you're going to get um, X, Y, and Z from me every single month. And then if you need more on top of that, then we charge uh, an additional, you know, X amount or whatever it is that's in your agreement. But the point is a monthly retainer is a good idea if you're looking to even out that kind of sinusoidal uh, sort of pattern of feast and famine that a lot of freelancers struggle with. And then the last option that I want to talk about is a per project or project based pricing. And no surprise, but this is what I'm the biggest fan of. I think it's the most effective. And I think it's the way that you can establish yourself as a true creative problem solver who brings a lot of value. It's the way you're going to make the most money off of your services. And it provides a win for the client because you lock in a pricing so that they are not getting surprised by um, changing, like, like, like they know the budget up front, so there are no surprises. Um, whereas hourly you can kind of, or daily, things can go longer and longer. Anyway, so per project pricing is where you basically, in a statement of work, 
you list out everything that the client will get in exchange for um, the money that you will be paid. So it's an exchange of services, you say who gets what, and what you wanna do with that is you wanna be as specific in your contract or your agreement as possible. And the reason you want to is because you're trying to lock in a pricing model and, and, a, and a, a set amount of money for this project, but there's so many unknowns before you actually get into the project that you need to have a bunch of contingencies that say, a certain limited number of revisions or work beyond or revi like you actually have to say what is a minor revision and then a major revision and then what is out of scope and then there needs to be certain dollar amounts tied to minor revisions major revisions and revisions that go out of scope you also need to have things in there that say things like if you learn that uh something is um pushing the project out of scope that you reserve the right to make an amendment, um, basically pause all the work, and then you guys have to come to an agreement after making some adjustments on either cost or project scope, and then you, you sign a document and you get back into it. So the point being is with pro per project pricing, while it offers you the ability to charge larger dollar amounts, it's also a way to win your client's trust early on because they feel like there, there are no hidden fees that you get to um, set these expectations early on. And you, as a freelancer, get to know how much you're going to get paid for the project as well, which helps you plan your own business, which is great. Again, the downside to a per project pricing is you are going to lose some and you're going to win some. And what I mean by that is some projects you're going to spend far more time on them than you expected and you're gonna feel like you should have been paid more for it. Whereas some projects you're going to get done much quicker than you expected and you will end up pocketing the difference and, and you'll, your, your hourly rate, if you were to break it down, would be much higher with the per project pricing. The other thing that project-based pricing allows is for you to not, uh, it separates your time from the work, which allows you to so you're not charging per hour, you're saying, you know, with my expertise, with my skills, with my tools, with what I do well, I can get you these things and it will cost us much and you're able to attach a premium or a dollar amount or some value to some of these less tangible goods that you're offering. Uh, so anyway, um, those, are, those are the major um, price models. So I wanna talk about actually setting rates now. So how do we actually come up with dollar figures? And there are a few things I want to mention here. So first of all, you have, uh, these are the things that basically you're gonna consider when you're setting your pricing. The first thing is going to be your hourly cost. Now we just got done saying, I'm not a big fan of hourly rates, but what I mean by going through hourly, what your hourly cost is, what that means is you decide what the minimum amount of money you can make for one hour of your time. And then whatever that number is, you can use that as an anchor to decide how much a service might cost. So I have a certain hourly rate that my time is worth. I have decided that it is this fixed number that never changes in the back of my mind. And it says if I'm pricing out a project, and if I think a project is going to take, um, let's see, I'll just throw some figures out. Let's pretend that my hourly rate was $100 an hour in my mind. I wouldn't share that with a client, but what I would do is I would say, during any given project, I should never make less than $100 an hour. What that would mean is if I know that a project is gonna cost, or if I think it's gonna cost $10 an hour, or sorry, 10 hours at $100 an hour, that's a $1,000 project, right? So knowing that in the back of my head, I would then set the price for the actual project. And then I would, I would try to ensure that I spent no more than that number of hours on the project. So now while that sounds like an hourly rate, it's just a tool for you in the back of your head to use to set the minimum price for your services. But you never list your hourly rate and you don't track your hours. Okay. So that's just something to think about. Now, your hourly cost means you basically decide how much work you're going to get per year or per, per week or per month. You look at your living expenses, and then you basically do the math to figure out how many 
uh, given the amount of hours you're gonna work per month and your monthly living expenses, how much do you have to make per hour in order to cover those living expenses? So by doing that, you're, you're coming up with a number that basically says, if I get paid just this bare minimum amount, I will at least be able to pay my living expenses, okay? So that's just covering your costs. Now there's another thing you should consider, which is market value. Market value has to do with how much your services are worth in a marketplace. What that means is don't necessarily start comparing you to everybody else who's offering your services because you're gonna be tempted to um, compete on price. And that's not a place you want to compete unless you live in a place where you need to make very little money to live. And if that's the case, you can actually pay the high, play the high volume, low price game. There's nothing wrong with that. But for a lot of people who have um, live in a bigger city where it's more expensive, they cannot afford to do that, okay? So that's, <clears throat> so think about your market value, understand where everybody else's pricing is and consider their skill level versus your skill level. If you find that nine out of 10 other creatives who provide the same type of work that you do are able to do um, better work than you at a, a rate that is lower than you're charging, then you are charging higher than market value. And um, it's gonna be a hard sell because there are gonna be so many people who are qualified to do the same work that you're doing for less money and just as good a work. And so what you wanna do is find yourself in this area where you are charging, say, a little bit more, like, say, maybe you're charging more than like 60 or 70% of market value. So a little on the higher end, but um, not always higher than everyone else. And, and then, you know, and this, there's a lot of things you have to consider. Of course, your skill level is one. If you are finding that you are, your work and your amount of experience is higher than most people on the marketplace, then you should be charging on that upper end. Again, kind of use your gut there. And then of course we have value-based pricing. This is a thing that's been pretty popular. It's been talked about by a lot of people online. And value-based pricing means you identify the value of your services to the client, and then you anchor your price in that. So let's say I'm selling baseball bats for a company and I need renderings for my website. Again, example, just because this is what I do, but um, Let's say in selling baseball bats, I have a new line of baseball bats and I want renderings for them. And with this new line of products, I am you know, likely to sell two, uh, $200,000 worth of baseball bats in the next six months. And they're all gonna be sold online. So I want those images or animations or whatever to really sell the product and look good. Well, if I can understand as the client that I have the ability to help my customer sell north of a quarter million dollars in baseball bats, then it is worth it for me to, uh, I guess value-based pricing says you can charge up to that number, somewhere you know, up to that number, and the client could still say, yeah, it was, it was worth it. So, but of course that's not real, realistic. You don't say, hey, you're gonna sell X amount of these, so I'm gonna charge you almost as much. It doesn't work like that because there are other costs that the client has to consider, of course. So the point is with value-based pricing is you just do a quick check. Um, here's perhaps a better example. If you're gonna help somebody sell their homemade goods on Etsy, and maybe they make $3,000 a year selling their homemade goods, you're not gonna charge them $5,000 for a project. But for a client selling 50,000 or even $200,000 worth of product, you can absolutely charge them more than $5,000 for your work. That's value-based pricing. Again, the client has to be able to connect a high amount of money with the product that you're helping them design or promote or market or whatever it is. This is why big websites for companies who sell a lot of products online, this is why a lot of agencies can make websites and sell them to, for $200,000, $300,000 because the company may be doing five million in sales over the course of a year. And that website is the lifeblood of their business. You know what I mean? So think about value-based pricing as well, just as a way to keep things in perspective. As a creative, 
you're going to be tended to go or you're going to be tempted to think like oh well i'm just making an illustration or i'm just designing a product or i'm just making a cool rendering there has to be a way for you to identify what that is worth to the client okay and um okay so a couple things here there are factors that you're going to want to consider when setting your rates as well um and you're going to think of your time we talked about that so how long is it going to take you to produce this um we're going to talk about your education so for example um while it's commonly known that in the creative industry no one tends to care about your um your your the school you went to or the degree you have your education can play a role into this if you paid a lot of money to go to a private school and you have a degree and you've really learned a lot about what you do you can and probably should charge a little bit more for your services um because you gotta you know that that degree should be worth something to you in the end um think of your overhead so a lot of creatives don't think of how much they're paying per year in their software for their computer for their electricity for their camera for their um their desk for uh, renting equipment or whatever it may be there's a lot of overhead that has especially with software um and if a client's coming to you and asking you to do something for them you can't just charge them based on the amount of time you spend on their project because your business you have to cover your expenses if you're only charging for your time how are you offsetting the cost of all the equipment that you have um every business considers overhead in their pricing right so um what about uh opportunity uh yeah opportunity cost there's something called opportunity cost that you may not be aware of and what that means is when you say yes to one job and that ties you up for six weeks you are effectively saying no to every other job that comes along in the next six weeks opportunity cost so like let's say you're on a job that cost you a thousand bucks but you work on it for six weeks and then another job comes in or an opportunity comes in for ten thousand dollars you can't take it because you're already pinned down and agreed to and working on the one thousand dollar job that's opportunity cost opportunity cost means you may charge more money or consider adding more to your fees in order to cover the the lost profit from not being able to accept jobs so there's something to think about there um another thing called profit <laughs> um businesses have one goal and that is to make money you as a creative um, may feel fulfilled by what you do and you may get a lot of joy out of what you do but if you're running a business you should be also earning money that's what businesses do and in order to earn money you have to not only cover your costs you have to actually earn a profit which means you should be adding an additional percentage onto your services to ensure that you're bringing in more money than you are spending on your business if that makes sense there's also a couple other things one um when you're doing work uh, especially as a solopreneur or a freelancer or a creative you're doing a lot of admin tasks on your own which could mean countless emails phone calls texts um could be file preparation making notes on a project it could be um contract writing revi revisions um proposals those types of tasks are taking time away that you could be doing the work and those types of tasks should be minimized and you should probably be charging a little bit extra on your fees to cover the costs of your time going into admin type tasks so that's something to consider and then another one is portfolio value so here's this so a lot of these things i've asked you to consider are all things that are going to drive the cost of your project up right but there is one thing that might drive the cost of your project down and that is portfolio value especially when you're earlier on in your career or when you're trying to grow and move from one level to another level when you're working with clients who max out at a five thousand dollar budget but you're trying to move into a bracket of clients who max out at say ten or fifteen thousand you may need to build up some experience working with bigger brands and get some bigger portfolio projects and bigger clients on your list and to do that you may actually work 
for lower money so you would compete on price you would you would cut a deal in order to ensure that you could say that you worked with Google or Disney or AT&T or who knows what but a big brand that everybody knows and recognizes by getting that on your portfolio that's going to drive bigger brands and customers to you so it's worth it to actually consider that you are paying a fee it's like a it's like a high, it's like a a good uh, client tax, if that makes sense. Like you're paying in by charging less to get a higher end client, a bigger name brand client over on your portfolio. Okay, so think about that too. Um, by the way, I am gonna keep an eye on the live chat. I know it's mostly people saying hi and I appreciate it. Sorry if I haven't acknowledged you yet. Um, pop questions in the live chat and I will get to them. I like doing Q and A. Um, my goal is not to rant at you this whole time. I do want to share as much valuable stuff as I can, but if I can answer some of your questions or use them as talking points, I'd really like to do that. So pop your questions in there as well, and we'll get to them. So now I want to talk, what we did is we just talked about all the factors that you might consider when it comes to setting your rates and deciding how much to charge for certain things. Now, what is your client actually factoring in when they're deciding their budget or whether or not to go with you. I think it's important for you to know that because clients care about what they need. They don't care about what you need. So if you can know what your client cares about and if you can cater to it, then they are going to go with you instead of going with somebody who's focused on their own needs. So your client is going to be looking at things like, first and foremost, your skill level. They will have decided whether or not you have the skills to do what they want based on what they've seen online, i.e. your portfolio or your social media. So it is important that you share your best work, but don't share work that's subpar. And if you do share work that's subpar, make sure it's very much separated from your good work. Don't let someone look at all your work in one location and see the crummy work and think, eh, this person doesn't know the difference between good and bad work really do your best to only share your strongest work if you want clients to be impressed by what you do. Now, another thing that they're gonna care about is your experience. So if you don't have enough experience, if a client thinks like, hey, he's never worked with someone in our industry, they've never worked with, or she's never worked on a project as big as ours and stuff, those can make your client hesitant to go with you because they are trying to ultimately, at the end of the day, trust you to earn your client's trust, you need to show or give them reasons to trust you. They don't, they don't owe you anything. The world doesn't owe you anything. The People don't start out trusting you until you betray them. It's the other way around. You have to earn people's trust and give them a reason to trust you. And then you can move forward with that relationship. So you want to show them that you have the experience and that you can handle what they're asking. It doesn't mean lying about what you do. It means assuring them or connecting the dots. So let's say that an automotive company wants to hire me to do some renderings. I'm not a car guy. I've not worked in the automotive industry. But if so if they go to my portfolio and they don't see cars, they may go, yeah, is he really the best option? There's a lot of guys that render cars. Let's go with someone who renders cars. But here's the thing. You as a creative may know that you don't need to have experience rendering cars or doing illustrations of food items or whatever you do um, to cater to that client. You know that you know your tools um, allow you to create artwork or, or, or do work that caters to the client and you may need to connect those dots for them. So you would hand pick a couple pieces in your portfolio and say, hey, I know I may not have done X, Y, Z, whatever you do, so maybe I would say, hey, I know I haven't rendered cars per se. I'm not a big car guy, but I'm going to show you some projects where I've done some really photorealistic rubber so you can understand that I can do a car tire. Maybe they're going to be doing, I don't know, reflective chrome parts. And I say, hey, here's some renderings I've done of all metal objects that are very complex where they're hard to light, but I, I show that I can do that. And I said, I can, I can hope that you can see that this is, is a different form, but this the skills that it took to produce this will be transferred to your project so you can kind of help them connect the dots um, so they can see that your experience is actually going to 
enable you to deliver on their project, um, on the project you're doing for them. So another one is your clients care about uh, reliability. Being reliable is almost the most important because when you're in a jam and when there's a deadline and when things have to happen and when there's consequences like lost money or missed deadlines, um, it, people need to be reliable. Um, it's just like one of those biggest things out there. So if you ever drop the ball, if you ever miss a deadline, if you say you're going to show up at a meeting at noon, but you show up at 12, 15, 12, 10, every time you do that, you're giving them a reason to not trust you, to not want to give you their business. You need to be reliable in the best way you know how to. You need to preemptively send them emails and reminders. You need to be early at all times. You need to, if you say, oh yeah, I'll have something to you by tomorrow afternoon, never have it in, say, that night instead. Now, I know things come up, and as soon as you get the idea that you cannot m make some sort of deadline or promise, then you contact them and say, hey, I'm embarrassed. I'm incredibly sorry. I thought this could be done by then. I ran into something unforeseen. This is the new deadline or whatever it is. Point is, they need to be able to trust you, right? Um, you need to be reliable. And then professionalism is huge. I think we talked about this on a previous live stream, but the way you present yourself, the language you use, uh, if your website is out of date, like let's say they go to the website in your email signature and they end up at a expired URL. I've done that so many times. I've seen that so many times and immediately I discredit whoever that is. I'm like, they don't even bother keeping their website live or maybe they just forgot to update their email signature, but that's a big detail to miss in my opinion. You don't want things misspelled. You don't want to be cursing on the phone and acting like you could care less about their project if you're just too aloof during your meetings. There's a lot of things there that would make you professional. And when bi the more businesses are willing to spend on a service, the more professional they want it to be. Why do you think all the highest paying professions have people who speak well, dress well, have good hygiene, carry themselves properly, have manners, make good eye contact, they don't talk over people, they're respectful, that goes a long way. And I know it's boring, but the older I get, the more I realize that that is really critical. And that's, by the way, these are free things that come at no cost to you that you can do to make your business or services more valuable. So think about it like that. A couple more here factors that your client considers. Social proof, and that's gonna be who have you worked with in the past and what have you done to demonstrate that you are good at what you do? If you have a big social media following, great. If you've worked with other customers or um, maybe if you've worked with their competitors, that's a good sign because they may go, oh shoot, he's done work for so-and-so. Hmm, maybe we should hire him to do work for us and, and, and tell him we want him to do better than he did on that project that, uh, that our competitor did or whatever. Um, social proof could mean that you have a mutual connection. So if somebody like on LinkedIn, they're, they're looking at you and maybe they find out that somebody you're connected to can vouch for your services, or maybe you a past, um, employment experience has made you more credible. So there's a lot of social proof you can put in, you know, testimonials, past, uh, clients, things like that. And then there's the last one I want to call out is legitimacy. So this is similar to professionalism, but legitimacy legitimacy is like how legit are you like do you look like someone who is a freelancer who's flying by the seat of their pants who is taking payments under the table who asks everyone just to paypal them who doesn't create a paper trail ever anything like that or are you somebody who has a business entity set up do you use contracts before you work with anybody do you take the time to um to, to think about things before responding to emails. How legit are you? The more you can think of yourself as a business, the, and, and not just think about it, but actually do the business things, you know, make sure you're filing your paperwork, make sure you're following laws, make sure you're reading up on whatever is relevant to you. Um, those ways of staying legitimate are going to make your clients trust you more because you're taking yourself seriously and the more legit you are, the more they're willing to pay for your services, okay? So again, this is about charging more money 
and charging what you're worth. And in order to get there, you need to consider a lot of things outside of just the quality of your work and how long it takes you to produce the work, okay? All right, so here's our last big section, um, how to quote a project. This is kind of what I think most of you tuned in for, so hopefully we built up to this properly and this will be useful. But here's how I suggest you quote a project. And when I say quoting a project, that's when a client says, hey, here's what we need. You've had the phone call. You understand what they're asking for. You've decided it is something you can offer them. So you said, yes, I want to work with you. Now it's your turn to write up a document and send it to them and propose what you're going to do for them in exchange for X amount of money. Okay, so that's your proposal. By the way, every project needs a proposal. Do not start working on a project without a proposal, even if it's speculative work, even if you're doing something for free to prove to them that you can do the rest of the job, you still need a proposal that explains what you will do for free and what you will not do for free and when they pay you and for what. Okay, so your proposal, there's two parts that I usually use. I use one called a creative service agreement, a CSA. And that is a document that explains the relationship and expectations that I set forth with my clients and myself. So it says uh, things like, you know, who owns what, how I charge them, what happens if a uh, project costs more money or um, working. It's basically all the expectations and what is expected of each um, party before you in, uh, engage. And now once that CSA has been signed, that CSA can, can um, hold up for um, a long time. It could be a year or even longer if you're gonna keep working with the same client. Now, the work order is the actual thing that says, here's what I'm gonna give you, all the details of the deliverables, how long it will take, how much it will cost. The work order changes for every project, but the CSA, the Creative Service Agreement, starts that relationship and holds up and um, outlives every work order. Okay, so then the work order is where you actually put in, you're going to, I'm gonna provide you with this thing, this thing, this thing, here's the dimensions of the artwork, here's how long it's going to last, uh, if it's a video, here's the format it's going to be in, here's the file type, I will upload it to you using Dropbox, I will, whatever, like all those details, it's gonna take this long, and then um, things like that. So how do we set values? So the first thing I suggest is that you're gonna itemize the phases each project will go through. You don't have to get too small and granular here, but a, a project phase is like, what are the major areas of a project? Well, first there's a setup phase or a discovery phase or a planning phase. That's where you're gonna spend time really making sure that you have all the information, that you have all the assets you need from the client, things like logos and templates and style guides and whatever else you need. Get all those together, your paperwork, your agreements. So that's one phase. Then you're gonna go into a phase where you actually start doing the work or perhaps there's other preliminary prep work you have to do. Then there's the, you know, let's say there's a graphic design phase, let's say there's a 3D modeling phase, let's say there's a rendering phase and then you deliver the project. Basically you're breaking the project into like, I don't know how many, but three, four, maybe five phases. And each of these phases will describe kind of like milestones in the project. And they'll, they'll be separate, separated by the type of work done in each phase. So nothing too complex there. Then you're going to attach a price to each service provided. So each of these phases will be considered a service. If project prep is one service, then you're gonna put a price on that. If 3D modeling is another service, then you're gonna put a price on that. If um, setting up your 3D scenes and files that take a long time, creating cameras, materials, animations, that's gonna be another phase. It's a service you're providing them. It will get its own price associated with it. So you go down and take that itemized list of services and you attach prices to each one of those. Now, notice I'm not saying charge a certain amount of money for each deliverable. You don't say I'm gonna do 10 renderings and each rendering is gonna cost $100. That again gets back into the issue of what we talked about before, which is that kind of hour-based pricing. It commoditizes the work. It's them saying, oh man, $100 per image? It sounds kind of steep. Um, let's just do five images. And all of a sudden, 
the project that was worth a thousand bucks to you became worth $500 to you. And now you're like, huh, well that backfired. How do I fix that? I ran into this earlier on in my career and I realized it was not the right way to present the idea. And the goal, again, my goal wasn't to sell the client more services than they needed or charge them more than um, I should. This is a, a psychological thing. Putting a price tag on each deliverable made, it did not communicate the value of what I was doing to the client for the client. So they saw, well, here's this thing I get and it cost me this much. But in fact, what you need to do is actually charge for each of those services within the entire project process. Because if you do so, and then they want to contest or say, ah, why is it so expensive for this project? They will go, oh, you had to spend time preparing all these file types. Oh, you had to go in and make some changes to our 3D model. Oh, then you had to spend a whole bunch of time setting up your 3D files and getting lights and cameras and all that. So, yeah, okay. Oh, then you had to spend time rendering. And then there was post-production. You had to go and change the images after they rendered. And then you had to go through and sort them and set up the Photoshop documents all in all the layers the way we wanted them. And then you had to send them to us. When you break all of what you're doing into these services and steps, they realize how much work goes into getting that result that you give them. Don't sell them the result, sell them the services and let them realize the benefits of those services in the way, like uh, as a deliverable, if that makes sense. So the other thing is you can't, if they want to, if it's, if they're concerned on price and they want to say, well, let's just, you know, can we eliminate one of these phases? They'll look at your services and go, ah, it's like a, it's like a pyramid. You can't take a block out from the bottom and expect it to still stand up. The service that you provided in the beginning is what allows the next step to happen and the next one and the next one. So if you pull out one of those services, the whole thing comes down and the project that you would have been able to deliver them, you can no longer deliver them because they're eliminating a critical step or phase in the project. So that's why you should be charging by services. And if your client sees that itemized out, they're almost never going to ask you to eliminate it. And if they do, then you can explain that to them ah, I would love to. I see that you need, you're asking about saving money. Well, the reason we can't eliminate this phase is because if we don't do this, then we can't do this, that, and the other. So the next thing, and we're going to come back on that, how to negotiate if they say you're charging too much. But the next thing I want to say is consider the 30% markup rule. So if you're really bad at figuring out all, and, and considering everything I mentioned earlier on in this live stream about all these things to consider, your experience, the market value, all these other things. And if your head starts spinning when you think about that, you could just say, okay, in my gut, I think this project is worth $3,000. And then you just add a 30% markup. So that would be what, 900 bucks or something like that. Again, I'm not a mathematician, sorry if I'm wrong. But then you add that 30%. And the whole point of that is that you're going to... Um, you're going to, that 30% counts for profit as well as unforeseen things like revisions or scope that you didn't realize you had, like things you'd have to do in the project you didn't expect. That 30%, especially if you're, um, if you have fewer than one years uh, or two years of freelancing under your belt, that 30% markup can be a really good rule of thumb to make sure that you don't keep miss judging how expensive a project should be. Um, <clears throat> and you don't itemize that 30% markup. You just go to each of those items that you put a price on and you just add 30% to it so that its price is 30% is higher than you initially put on it. So the other thing is when you're, when you're attaching a price to each of your services, weight the service that is the most important to the project and make it a little bit more expensive than the rest. So again, I'm gonna use this example because I do rendering, but people are buying the renderings and <clears throat> if they're going to, if, if the actual rendering part of the project costs a little bit more than the other parts of the project, um, it's easier for the client to understand that they are paying for the rendering. So in their mind, they expect that part to be the little bit more expensive because that's actually what they're getting in the end, but also, it's the one part of one phase of the project they cannot eliminate because that's what they're coming to you for. So just consider that as well. 
Um, another one is discounts. Let's talk about discounts. This is this is one that comes up a lot. Um, it's very common for clients to say, hey, give us a break on this first project so we can find out if we want to work with you. And then if we like you, we'll keep bringing work back to you, right? And this causes a couple of issues. Like I said, do you go to the dentist and say, yeah, I'll pay you 10 bucks to get this tooth fixed. And if I like the result, I'll come back with more work. They wouldn't, they'd say, okay, go somewhere else. And that's kind of the answer that you need to give. But if you don't want to get rid of your client like that, then you need to kind of work at a different approach. And that is that your most valuable customers should be getting discounts. Customers that you have no history with should not be getting discounts. Basically, a project will be more expensive if you've never worked with somebody before because you don't know what to expect, you don't trust each other yet, and you don't have a system or any rapport yet to base your working relationship off of. But down the road, let's say three projects in, and you've got a good relationship with a client, they keep coming back to you, you owe them, you owe them the privilege of a, an occasional discount or perhaps doing more work for them without changing the price so that you are communicating with them, hey, I really appreciate this. I want to keep this relationship going. The more work we do together, the, the better deals you're going to get type thing. That is how I personally think you should treat your clients. Um, I know it's counterintuitive and it can be a little tough, but if you explain to a new client, hey, the first project's always the fastest, it's always the slow, or <clears throat> let me just say that again. If you tell a new client that the first time you engage with them is always more expensive and typically slower, but then every project after that tends, you, you work more efficiently, you guys work better, you, you become more of a team and um, projects get done faster and therefore you can actually save them money on future projects as well. So you kind of turn the tables and say, you know, let's work out something small and if it's good, we're gonna keep working together and the more we work together, the more breaks I'm gonna give. So that's something that you can consider there. And then, um, be in, I kind of said this, but be loyal to your best customers. Again, if you are, you know, I think it's courteous to make sure you let them know when you're about to become busy, if you can tell. Um, try to keep your schedule open for them if you wanna keep working for them. Keep communicating with them. And then last point here I wanna give you is negotiating on value or scope, but not on price. What do I mean by that? So there are a lot of times where somebody has said, hey, this is good and everything, but it's simply out of our budget. And I said, hmm, okay, well, what is your budget? And then they said, well, our budget is X. So let's say I gave a proposal that was $8,000. And they said, yeah, but we really wanna work with you, but our budget's $5,000. And I said, hmm, okay. Well, what, uh, let's see. I said, so here's, here's what we can do. I said, what if I, um, what if you guys reduce the number of products you want rendered from me? Can you take the current list of 35 and make it smaller, like 22? And they said, yeah, we can do that. So you can negotiate on scope and say, hey, let's still work together, but you're, you need to rein in how much you're asking me to do for this price. And, and, and if they can agree to that, then you, you, two things are good. One, you're, you're, not, you're, you're still gonna get the work. You're, you're not gonna work too much, you're not gonna do more work than you should be for that price, but you're also learning that this client is willing to work with you and, and willing to compromise as well and meet you halfway. And that is a sign of a good client you wanna keep working with. Another thing you can do is you can negotiate on value. So you can negotiate on scope, like we just said, that's when, you, when the client says, here's our budget, you said it was costing this much, we can only spend this much, and you say, okay, just reduce the amount of things you want me to do and I'll do it for this price. The other thing you can do is you can negotiate on value and that is where the client says, hmm, well, we think you're a little expensive, we, we would, we're, you're charging us this much, but we would be more comfortable paying this much, what can we do? Well, <clears throat> if you negotiate on value, you can say, I appreciate that. Here's the thing, um, I can't afford to go lower than the prices I've already set, but what I can do is I can offer to do a little bit more for you for the price that I quoted. So instead of asking them to reduce the scope, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm gonna give you a little bit of extra so that this becomes worth it for you. So let's say they say, well, we want this, 
but um, our budget is only so much. You, you're like, well, I'll give you this plus this plus this, but it's still gonna cost you that amount of money. And you can be strategic and make sure that what you're giving them is not gonna cost you too much extra effort or too much extra time, but is still going to give them value. So they're like, oh wow, we're getting three things instead of one thing for this price. Okay, now we're ready to move forward. So that's negotiating on value. And you can negotiate on both scope and value in a project to meet a client at their budget. And that's another thing I highly recommend you do. Get creative with negotiations because again, at the end of the day, you guys are on the same team. You're both trying to get the same thing done and you want the relationship to be good. And by negotiating and working together and coming to some sort of agreement, you show it's a foundation of a good relationship with your client. A lot of trust is built in this phase, okay? So, whew, that's a lot. Um, I just went on for almost an hour straight. Um, hopefully that wasn't too much information and hopefully it wasn't too vague. But these are all things I've personally experienced and gone through and some of it, um, some of it was learned the hard way. Some of it was just uh, uh, things I learned from other more experienced people. So I hope that that was helpful. And um, yeah, at that, at, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and take a minute to look at the live chat and see if there's any questions you guys have or anything you guys want to share uh, that, you know, with everyone else. Um, but yeah, we'll probably keep this going for a few more minutes. Um, unless I have to wrap up, I think we're doing all right on time. Um, and then also going forward, I know this is on a Saturday. Um, I've been going back and forth on when to, to hold these because I want to make these available when people are actually online. Um, also balancing with my workload, I've been considering going just to uh, one video every Monday and going back and forth between a live stream and then a YouTube tutorial video, live stream, pre-recorded video. Uh, so you guys let me know what you think. Um, if I can keep it up, I will, and I'll keep this on Saturday mornings, but this may eventually move to a Monday morning at 9 a.m. We'll see. Okay, so a couple things in the live chat. Um, Jong said related to opportunity costs, when you take on projects at your level, are you only taking one at a time or do you tackle multiple? And that's a great question. I know freelancers who thrive on two to three projects at a time. Maybe it's something I will eventually get to, but right now I struggle with that. I only do one project at a time. And that is, you're right, that is actually a pretty big deal when you think of opportunity cost. Because when I'm doing one project at a time, I need to make certain that it's a bigger project. That if it takes a week or two longer than I expected, or if another project comes along that I cannot take on, that the one that I'm doing is actually worth it. And in the beginning, you're not gonna be able to do that. True story, I was working on a project that was like, I don't know, two or $3,000, maybe maybe a little more than that. And it just started and it was gonna take like three weeks. And then someone came in and said, hey, I've got this project. It's got a budget of about twenty, twenty-five thousand uh, dollars $25,000. We need it done in about four weeks. Or can you do it? And I, I was so bummed because I had to just say, I'm so sorry. I, I wish I could, but I am already engaged with a client and it's going to take up all my time for the next three weeks. I'm so sorry. I had to refer it out to someone else. So you're right. It can bite you in the butt in the beginning, but that's why you have to learn how to really vet clients and projects before you accept them. And then also having a good referral network too. Being able to send somebody to a friend who is kind enough to give you a finder's fee when they complete the work, that's a, that's a, that's a good thing too. Okay, um, another thing uh, Jong said was related to profit. Is there a general percentage in the industrial design industry that, that you are establishing for profit? Let's see. Oh, I see. In manufacturing, we call it VAM, value added margin. Yeah, <clears throat> the short answer is no. Um, so again, to be clear, I am one year into my freelance journey. <clears throat> Sorry, I need some water. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, um, I've been doing this freelance stint for a year now. From 2014 to 2016, I did my first round of freelancing. And that was hard, and that's where I learned a lot. It was not nearly as sex successful as I have been lately. Um, by my own standards, and so I learned a lot there. <clears throat> um, so what percentage am I establishing for profit? The short answer is no. I just hit one calendar year, 
And the way I set it up was I didn't worry about how much money I made the first year. I saved up enough money that when I left my previous employer, I could take zero jobs for six or seven months and be absolutely fine. So I really didn't worry about any how much work I got. I took some time off and then I slowly started accepting jobs and I basically lived paycheck to paycheck for the first year. Now, in the past year, in the past few months, things have really changed where now we, we entered 2020 and I said, okay, I've taken my break, I've gotten used to freelancing, I've built up some sort of repeat, you know, people know that I'm freelancing. And then I got more serious about actually focusing on the income for this year only a few months ago. So it's the year starting from this summer to next summer that I'm, I'm actually trying to hit income goals. And at that point, profit, I mean, I don't quite know what percentage I'll be at. Um, my only goal is to make sure that um, I hit a certain number that I set that's very personal to me. Um, and then that will let me know that like I've hit a milestone that I wanted to. So yeah, I don't have a good answer for that one. Andrew Hodg Hodgson says, um, hey, Will, could you talk more about your experience with project creep and how you've avoided it in the past projects? Yeah, this one's quite easy. I struggled with this in the beginning for sure. And when I say in the beginning, I really mean like, again, 2014 when I did that. Um, project creep. So I did do per project pricing. I've, I've almost never done hourly pricing. I read per project pricing was good, so I did it. But then, like you said, projects would creep or scope would creep. But the problem was it was usually my fault, not the client's. It's that I didn't read the situation. I didn't ask enough questions and I didn't anticipate how much things would creep. So right now I include two rounds of revision at every phase of the project free of charge to my clients. And I make sure that they know that some of the more expensive prices they're paying me is because I'm already including revisions in that cost. And that also allows you to establish a longer timeline because you have to assume revisions are going to take extra days to do because people don't respond right away. So let's say a project starts getting out of control and you say, oh no, this is becoming a bigger project than I anticipated. You pump the brakes, you say, hey client, wanted to hop on a call, or actually I prefer emails. I don't like phone calls for things where I need to be very careful about the words I use. I like phone calls for initial discovery sessions where we actually talk about the project, learn, uh, you, you establish rapport and trust. But later in the project where something very specific comes up and it's a little bit of a touchy or uncomfortable situation, go ahead and send that email saying, hey, um, wanted to address the, the project that we're working on. I've realized that I did not anticipate how much whatever it would take, how many phases, how much revisions, how long this would take, whatever. I'm learning right now that I grossly underestimated how much whatever this would take. I need to, uh, I, I, I'm putting the project on hold until we can address a new scope outline and, agree, and come to an agreement because at the current uh, agreement that we are using for this project, I cannot deliver uh, or meet your expectations, something like that. You have to take that responsibility on yourself and not say, hey, client, you keep asking for too much. It's actually about you saying, hey, I'm sorry, I couldn't anticipate this. We need to come to an agreement that works for both of us so I can deliver this project in a way that you and I are both proud of. So that's, that's, that's how I would approach that. Um, we've got <clears throat> Krishan. Uh, which are the best freelancing platforms for f freshers? I don't know what that means. If that's a typo and you mean for freelancers, um, I still don't know. I've never used a website like Fiverr or Upwork or anything like that. Um, I have no experience with those. Uh, Jong said, related to my last live stream, if the project or client is big enough and you want to add it to your public case studies, previous work, do you ever consider a discount if they allow you to publish it? Yeah, great question. Although if they say that, at, so my basic work agreement says every client I work with, we sign that creative services agreement. One of the clauses in it says I am allowed to use their logo and the work we worked on in my public portfolio for my own promotion. This is the one 
article that gets disputed the most frequently by the client. They're like, oh, I don't know if we want you to do that. So it's on by default <clears throat> in my agreement. And if they say that they're not sure, then I say, okay, if I have to keep this secret, then there's going to be a surcharge added to it. So you make the project more expensive if they say, no, you cannot share it. Then it's up to them. If they want to save money, they'll let you publish it. If it's more important to them that they keep it secret, then you get more money for it. Win-win. Um, so yeah, just think about that. Um, David says, what are my tips to someone who wants to start freelancing or when should someone quit their full-time job and start being a freelancer? I'm trying to think if I talked about this or addressed this lately. I don't know. Um, my suggestion is that you, you should not quit your job to freelance. I think you should freelance on the side um, for as long as you can stand to. And, and you get to the point where you're about feeling like you're burnt out because you've been full-time and freelance. And all the money you make from the freelance on the side should go into your business startup fund. And when that hits six amount, six months of income that you can live off of, I think you're ready to make the plunge. That's what I did. Okay, uh, should we charge the clients when they ask for project insights? I'm not sure what that means, Vivek, but um, it sounds like you're talking a little bit more like, like if someone's calling you up saying, hey, what do you think about this? Uh, should we hire someone to do this? How much work does this take? To me, that's consultation. They're consulting you. They're leaning on you for your expertise and they're hoping to learn from your expertise. Yes, you should charge for that. But you can't just say, well, you got to pay before I'll talk to you. What you want to do is hop on the phone and say, hey, I understand you have a lot of questions and due to my experience, I think I can answer a lot of those questions. But unfortunately, I'm too busy to just hop on the phone without anything, um, without a, an agreement. I'm more than happy to consult with you. Here's my rate. Let me know if you're interested. And, and that's all. That's all it has to be. Let them know that, that you're more than happy to um, consult with them. That's one of the few times I would suggest maybe an hourly rate is, is perhaps a good thing. Um, but again, that's up to you. Maybe your consultation is worth $5,000 if it's going to save them $50,000. So you don't charge them $5,000 an hour because no one's going to pay that. You say, well, my consultation, which may be up to five hours of, of phone calls and meetings, is going to cost this package price $5,000 because in the end, it's going to help you hire somebody and improve your, your whatever pipeline and not waste this money, whatever it is. So yeah, I think that that's a good opportunity if that's what you're asking. So should one charge for brainstorming if that's part of her skill? Yes. If that's part of your skill? Yes, you should. Call it what you want. Brainstorming's fine. I try to come up with n names that, um, this sounds silly, but like the, what you name a service can actually change people's perception of its value. And brainstorming sounds like something that should be done for free. Strategy is what people pay for. Strategy and discovery. Use different words for, your, um, for brainstorming and things like that. Um, Peter says that was great. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And Gerardo... Thanks for doing it. Awesome, man. Sim says, thanks. Al, damn, I came up late. That's okay. This is YouTube. <laughs> this will be, li well, it won't be live, but it will be on the channel once it's done processing. You can watch it later. No worries. Nicholas says, thanks for sharing your experience. Always important. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, Peter says, I prefer to tackle complicated. Oh, wait, sorry. There's things going on. I prefer to tackle unanticipated issues with a phone call. Yeah. Um, phone calls. So I've, I've learned this. Um, I am right on that edge of like sort of being a millennial. I was born in 88, so I'm not, you know, super young, but like I am young still. And I've learned that people who are born like in the early 80s uh, or just have that experience over me tend to be much more eager to get on a phone call to resolve something. And um, especially when I was like in college or shortly after there, I was always an email person. But the busier you get and the more communications you have with more people, the more you're going to be pressed for time and the more you're going to learn a phone call is the way to go. It also has a lot to do with your own personal confidence. I did something called Toastmasters, which is where you practice delivering public speaking. And that has done so many things to help me in my own career, especially when you're on the phone and you need to confidently 
express what you're doing, why you're doing it, and, and resolve issues. So I do agree with Peter there. It's a good, it's a good thing to do if you can. Uh, Rodrigo says, hi, how do you overcome complicated times when there is no good number of projects running or less income? Um, if you have a skill, sell your knowledge. Create an ebook, create a course, do some mentoring one-on-one, -on -one. Um, create digital products, make assets for whatever software you use, sell that. Um, there's a million and one ways. Um, so if there's no clients coming in and you're, you're struggling with that, take the time if you can afford it to actually build a funnel to get clients to you. But if you can't, then you need to pivot and start selling some of your, like bottle up your knowledge and sell it and help other people and put a fair price on it. Last question from David says, how do you promote or market yourself? Do you send emails to companies or do you just share uh, your work online and clients just come to you? I think this warrants its own live stream. So potentially in the future, but if you didn't see it, that previous live stream on how do you find clients, I answer a lot of those same questions in that live stream I did. Specifically to answer that question, how do I pro promote myself? I think it's, it's my, my number one goal is to be a solution provider. I provide solutions for people regardless of where they are in their career. If I can make it clear that I offer solutions to people at every point, whether they're a student learning or they're a professional who needs a job done, if I am making the, if I'm solving problems for them, then they're going to remember me and they're going to come to me with work and opportunity. I don't think of marketing myself. I don't think of promotion. All I do is I try to share things that help someone. And if it doesn't help anyone or if it's not interesting, um, or if there's, then I just don't, I just don't do it. And I don't do paid. I don't do anything like that. And I found that just by being active and helping other people through tutorials, through live streams, through answering DMS to everything like that, um, people come to me with work. So yeah, that, that answers that question. All right. Um, just got a message from the fiance. I got to go pick her up from work since we share one car. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to pop off this live stream here in another minute. So thank you guys. Thank you guys very much for your time and attention today. Um, I'll answer the questions I see on screen now, and then I have to wrap it up. So have I ever had a client ask for the working CAD files? If so, how would I charge? So um, project files come at a premium. If there's not, if that's not been something that's been agreed upon when we started the project, then I explained to them that there, there's going to be a markup. And here's why. And this is this can be uncomfortable, but you have to say, you know, this is what I, you know, this is what I do for a living. And when I give away all my project files, it gives my customer the ability to take that work and then use those assets, give them to somebody else or use them internally. And that cuts myself out of the working agreement. So the cost to get those project files is X. And you just let them know. It, I, a lot of this comes down to getting the confidence to have that discussion. And then once you've done it once, you realize it's not that bad. Um, I strongly encourage you to identify before you quote them whether or not they're expecting project files. In fact, I think that's something I include in my agreement. It just basically says, if you want source files, they're going to come at an extra charge. That way, they know up front. Um, Rushank says, huge inspiration. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Nair says, thanks for doing this. Awesome. Got to leave. See you, Peter. Thank you. All right. Rodrigo says, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. I hope you guys have a great weekend wherever you are. Thanks for spending your time with me. Oh, hey, Art. I'm just popping off. I don't know if you just joined or if you're just... But anyway, good to see you. Um, yeah, wherever you guys are at, uh, it means a lot to me. I understand there's a lot of ways you can spend your time. So the fact that you just hung out for any time with me here today is huge. I really appreciate it. And the whole goal of these is to, again, share what I have with you. But also, um, I enjoy doing these. This is a lot of fun. So thanks for spending your time with me today, guys. And until next time, happy rendering.